Hey everyone, all right, we are winding down the semester. Uh, we have two more days left of content and then we are into uh, final presentations for your small group book reports. Uh, today, there are two YouTube videos you need to watch. Uh, this one um, is specific to this class. I have another class where I talk about uh, small group communication. I'm gonna post that video as well. Um, both of them will be about 30 minutes. Uh, this one, will, actually this one will be a little bit shorter. Um, but make sure you watch both videos and then the big thing today is to make sure that you are reading uh, Harrison Bergeron and then turning in uh, your, your response paper to Harrison Bergeron, which I'll give you a little bit more information on the last slide here. All right, so small group communication, uh, this is what we're talking about. The first thing that we need to understand is what are small groups for, all right? Um, and again, I'm gonna go through this quickly because there's a more detailed uh, explanation in the following video. Uh, so make sure that you also watch that video, especially for the exam, all right? Small groups function for two reasons. The first is task oriented. So for instance, uh, a sports team will come together and their task is to win a championship, right? And then possibly after the championship's over, those sort of relationships dissolve. Um, uh, in, at work, right? The, the management might put you in a group in order to solve some sort of problem at work or to sort of launch a new product. Once you and your team have launched the product, then that group dissolves and maybe you get put into a different group for the next product launch, right? So this is what one small group is for, right? It's task oriented. The other reason small groups form are relationships. So you have primary and secondary groups as far as your relationships. Humans are social animals, right? We like to be in relationship with other people. Um, it's why you have you know, casual conversations with individuals uh, that have uh, no sort of monetary or task oriented benefit outside of just wanting to talk to strangers, all right? So your primary groups are close and relational. Uh, these are family relationships that you have. You, you know, you come together to celebrate holidays with these individuals. You take vacations with them, um, you know, evening dinners, these sorts of things, all right? Uh, secondary groups are more casual, they're more social. There might be uh, friends you have at school. Um, uh, they might be teammates, right? And you're sort of like moving through these spaces and you know that there is an end point to these secondary groups, right? And the end point might be college graduation. It might be the end of, you know, a sports season. Um, but that's what a secondary group is, right? Family relationships, you sort of assume like these people are gonna be in my life forever, all right? These are more primary, all right? You might have some best friends from high school that sort of last that long, uh, as some of you might be figuring out now, all those like, we're gonna be friends forever stuff that you say senior year of high school. Uh, quickly turns into, you know, maybe there's one or two people you keep in contact with from high school, all right? Okay, so well, something I want you to think about is, you know, what are some of your primary and secondary groups with regard to the relationships that you have? Uh, but also think of, you know, what groups are you involved with that are more task oriented, where you are less concerned about the um, sort of like day-to-day, -day, um, you could say like, you know, happenings or even like emotions of the people involved and you really are only interacting with those individuals uh, in order to complete a task, right? And here's the thing, uh, we've talked a little bit about this before. When people start getting on your case and say, you should be emotionally invested in everybody, that's not true, right? Not everyone's emotionally invested in me. I don't have to be emotionally invested in everybody else. Um, this whole idea of like affirmation culture, which we've talked a little bit about, this whole idea that, you know, I can't feel like a whole person if all 7 billion people on the planet don't affirm me, right, and have some sort of interest in like the happenings of my life. It's ridiculous because I have no space to care about the happenings of 7 billion people. Um, I can generically hope that everyone does well, but when we get down to the nuts and bolts of it, um, it's impossible, all right? So there are task-oriented groups that you have. Think about what those are. Think about the relationship groups that you have. Uh, and then within relationship groups, primary and secondary groups, all right? How small groups make decisions. Uh, this will be on the exam, so make sure you are following along, all right? Now, each of these methods have pro has pros and cons, all right? Some are better than others, depending on the situation, all right? So a consensus, all right, consensus forming is people come in with multiple ideas, and then we start to sort of, you know, figure out what the best sort of third way solution is. Uh, and we do form a consensus where everybody agrees on the solution, um, but it usually takes a while of wrestling around with a lot of ideas. But at the end, it's like we all sort of agree that this is the best path forward. 
the expert decision is if you think about a president, all right, a president has lots of cabinet members. And what each of those cabinet members do is they come into the president. Let's say that there are 10 cabinet members that are visiting the president on a given day. Um, and they say each individual person has a path forward for policy. There needs to be no consensus. There is no majority rule in that room, right? What happens is, is that everybody presents their ideas to the president, and then the president, as the expert in the room, just chooses which policy he or she wants to move forward with, right? This is how this is, it, it is, works in businesses a lot, right? The board members come in, and they, you know, whoever the chairman of the board is, there might be 15 board members, and they all give out their different ideas. It's not about consensus. It's not about a majority rule. It's just we're going to give you the ideas, and the person in charge gets the final say, all right? Compromise. Compromise is more political, right? Neither side gets everything that they want. Neither side feels like the answer is completely satisfactory, right? However, you know, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. You know how to compromise works, right? And that's different than a consensus. A consensus is everybody feels good about it at the end. A compromise is everybody feels mostly good, but there's some definite things that are kind of missing out. All right, uh, majority rules. Um, you know, everybody, you know, we take a vote. Uh, obviously, we've talked about some of the pros and cons of majority rules um, with regard to uh, when we talked about the Constitution earlier in the semester. If you have majority rule, what that could end up being is what's sometimes referred to as the tyranny of the majority. So the majority could vote to take away all the civil liberties of people who are in the minority, right? So if the majority says, you know, we don't like this person, let's make this person pay additional taxes, let's make this one person uh, do our homework for us. Let's, you know, make this one person, you know, suffer the consequences of whatever it is we want them to do. They can turn into a, into a tyranny. So as we've discussed with the Constitution, the United States is not a, a democracy, right? A, uh, the, um, the United States is a republic, which means even if the majority votes to take away people's individual rights, you know, we have systems in place, checks and balances that step in and say, look, you can't vote to take away somebody's individual rights, right? Individuals have rights, and then, um, yeah, that's how it goes, all right? We go from there, okay? And then finally, uh, unanimous decision. Unanimous decision is a bit more, um, everybody comes in the room and we're all on the same, all on the same page almost immediately. This is what we're gonna talk about, kind of uh, moving forward with regard to uh, some of the problems. Uh, of a unanimous decision when we get to group think in a couple slides here. All right, but unanimous decision is everybody's on board. We're all on the same page. Let's go ahead and vote on this and get to happy hour early. Okay, um, we'll save the problems with that for the final slide. All right, but the, the unanimous decision is can be a big problem when it comes to group think. Um, the way that groups uh, form. So this is just sort of like a fun way of kind of memorizing it because it kind of rhymes until you get to adjourning. Um, but you know, if you throw a little bit of an accent on it, it all kind of rhymes, right? So the ways in which small groups form are the five following steps. Forming, storming, norming, performing, and then adjourning, if you kind of mess up the pronunciation a little bit, right? This is going to be common throughout any org comm class you ever take, right? These five things are sort of well known in the field. The forming stage is really the question of why. Why is the group coming together? Like, what's the purpose of us being together, right? And again, one of it could be, we need to get together for the next two months because we have a final group project. And as soon as that project's over, you're going to adjourn, you're, the, the group is going to dismantle, right? It could be, why are we forming? And part of it could be just like social interaction, like the need to have friends, right? The need to be a part of, you know, a, commun a, a community, right? The storming phase is when you are trying to clarify roles within the group. So this is where some tension and some conflict can come into play. Uh, because if you're in a small group, for instance, somebody has to do the outline, somebody has to write the paper, somebody has to do the PowerPoint, somebody has to be the point person who is constantly sending out reminders, right? You have like secretaries and treasurers and presidents and vice presidents, right? Leadership roles, right, within the group. Um, and you're going to have some friction because somebody might say, no, I really want to do the PowerPoint. Someone else might say, I really want to do the PowerPoint. Like, I want you to do the paper. And it's like, I don't want to do the paper, right? You're going to have friction with regard to sort of figuring out how that group can work best as far as the different roles that people are playing, right? So that's the storming phase. We don't know each other. 
we just got together and we got to kind of work this out so that we start to work really well together so we can have a good final project. All right. So storming is just all that tension, figuring out roles. The norming phase is when everybody's settled into their roles and the group has settled into some sort of pattern. So for instance, let's say you're a part of a group and for the next four weeks, um, every Monday night, you plan to meet at five o'clock in order to work on your project. The first Monday comes and um, out of 10 people in your group, two people are 15 minutes late. And on the very first day, people are 15 minutes late. As a group, you have a choice. You can either say, look, we said we're going to be here at five because we only have an hour. Like, this is disrespectful. Like, we need to be here at five because that's what we agreed on. Right. You can be the bad guy or you can not say anything and you can say, OK, hey, welcome, everyone. Let me catch you up on what we did. You know that the next Monday, those two people who are 15 minutes late are probably going to be late again. And a third and a fourth person might be a little bit late. So the norming phase is once you establish those rules in the clarifying storming phase, the norming phase is sort of how those rules get um, interpreted, enforced, reinforced, et cetera. Now you could be a group. There's nothing wrong with being a group that's 15 minutes late to every meeting. All right. I'm not saying that these, you know, you have to have, you know, yet you'd have to be on time. Right. What I am saying is like whatever happens in the first couple of meetings between your group, uh, between between your group members, that's what's going to become the norm, right? So if you let people slide and be a little bit late, if you let people turn in their work a little bit late, if you let people turn in sloppy work and you don't confront them on it, that's going to become the norm, all right? And again, this isn't a good or bad judgment. It's just that's what's going to happen. And that's what happens in all groups. Um, some of you who have had me in like physical classrooms, you know how much of a, a, a how hard headed I am when it comes to being on time. Um, you know, if, if class starts at nine o'clock, you show up at nine o'clock. And the reason is exactly this, because I know, and you all have seen this in some of your like physical classrooms with professors. Um, if you have a professor who kind of the first week or two lets everybody be five minutes late, by the end of the semester, people are showing up 20 minutes late, right? And that's a burden for everybody because one, it's disruptive, but two, it's a burden for the professor because now I have a student who's 20 minutes late and they want to stay afterward and say, what did I miss? What did I miss? What did I miss in the beginning of class? And I, you know, now I'm repeating myself and doing these sort of private lessons for people who just, you know, it, they just should have been there on time, right? The same thing is true with turning in your homework. It's like you turn your homework in on time. And if a professor sets the tone, sets the norm that there's a cutoff date. And if I dock you 50%, let's say for your first assignment, it's 50%, uh, 50 off if it's late you're not going to turn in late assignments anymore, right? So that's what happens during the norming phase, all right, is what are these norms? And they have to happen early because it's very, very hard to sort of change directions of the ship once you've let it slide two or three times, right? If I let someone show up late the first couple of weeks, it's hard in week number three to then try to be a hard ass, right? And the same is true with your groups, right? If you're very, very nice to everybody, it's hard a couple days before the presentations do to say like, okay, we screwed up and now you, now you have to be confrontational, which it's going to be a bigger confrontation as opposed to just sort of like taking care of it day one. All right. So that's the norming phase. Performing phase, self-explanatory, right? Now you're giving the presentation or you're on the basketball court playing the game, right? And then the adjourning phase is, has the mission been accomplished? Um, does the group still need to be held together? So after your small group book reports that you're going to do in a week, uh, the, it's probably the class that you're probably going to dissolve, right? Uh, the group's going to dissolve. Uh, you could say like, Hey, we all became friends and now we're going to stay some sort of small group, but it's going to be more relationship oriented where we're going to like hang out and, you know, grab lunch together. Right. Um, or it could be, we're going to briefly adjourn, but then like next semester, we're going to be in a different class together. And I want all of you in my group again. All right. So this adjourning phase can be in flux. Right? It could dissolve for the task, but then maybe six months later, your boss comes and says, hey, your group did a good job. I want you to sort of reconvene and do the next product launch. All right. So that's what happens in a small group. Know those five steps. All right. Finally, uh, we're circling back a little bit uh, with unanimous decision stuff. Um, small groups can succumb to what's known as groupthink. Groupthink is bad. All right. Group think is bad. All right. What group think means is that when a group gets together and 
from the start, they are all on the same page. What happens is, is that everybody stops critically thinking about the subject matter because no one is challenging their thoughts. So for instance, let's say that you are a part of uh, the Bernie Sanders for president campaign and you and your team need to get together to, um, you know, think that you, you want to talk about politics. You're not strategizing to winning, but like you and your friends who are all Bernie Sanders supporter, like you just want to have them over and it's like, hey, let's just talk about politics. Very, very quickly, what happens in that group, all right, and this happens in any group, very, very quickly, what will happen is everyone will come in and say, oh, you're a Bernie Sanders supporter. Oh, me too. Okay, we all agree on everything. Okay, taxes, like let's raise them. Let's, you know, implement um, universal health care and $15 minimum wage and like free college and like, oh, we just all agree on that. Cool. And then this, the conversation goes from critically and logically thinking through these issues to because we're all on the same page and agree. Now we're just gonna sort of emotionally talk about how much we love Bernie Sanders and how much we hate Donald Trump and the establishment and whatever, and the 1%. And it becomes this sort of very uh, catty, um, emotional, uh, like high school drama fest, right? And here's the thing, this happens to all types of groups, no matter your education level, no matter your age. Once you know that everybody in your group already agrees with your conclusion, you all start to sort of just go after people who disagree we uh, disagree with you in very emotional sort of like high school mean girl type of ways all right and nobody's thinking clearly about the issue anymore so for instance if we all come in the room and say fifteen dollars minimum wage that's good right yeah oh you agree too right we all agree now we just start like crapping all over everybody um, like and just say like oh the people who disagree with us must be like mean, mean nasty people right? They're just greedy, greedy, greedy people. Um, instead of saying, you know what, like, I bet the people who disagree with us probably have really good logical reasons for disagreeing with us, like inflation and you know, like un unemployment rates. And like, let's critically think through this and try to give them the benefit of the doubt in order to best come up with logical ways, like the pros and cons of raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, right? If I'm firmly in the $15 an hour camp, I don't see any cons if nobody is challenging my views. I just say like, oh, it's all pluses and everybody who disagrees is just is a horrible, horrible person. As opposed to being in a group that says, uh, some people agree, $15 minimum wage, some people disagree. And what happens is we have this sort of tension back and forth in a productive way, right? Don't be a jerk, but in a productive way to say, what are some of the pros? What are some of the cons? Like what might happen? What might not happen? Let's logically think through this, all right? Group think is bad because when you sit in a room and everybody just agrees, everybody stops critically thinking about the issue, all right? Uh, these posters here um, uh, on the PowerPoint are sort of like fan fiction posters uh, inspired by 1984. 1984 um, had the individuals called the Thought Police. They came around and, right, like, it looks like you've had too much to think like you're thinking on your own you're thinking critically uh you're not just sort of like going along with big brother right which is sort of this like ominous you know government like overlord all right so this is what i challenge people to do uh, when it comes to issues of groupthink um spend your academic life resisting groupthink now that doesn't mean that you dis it doesn't mean that you always disagree uh, with everybody sort of in your field, right? But what it means is that when you find yourself in a room where everybody agrees pretty quickly on the topic at hand, you should be a person who at least stands up and says, hey, it looks like we all agree. Like, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a little bit. Let me try to give strong arguments for the other side. Um, let's try to critically think about, you know, instead of just saying people who don't want to raise the minimum wage are mean, awful people, Let's actually think about some like strong arguments as to why minimum wage probably shouldn't be raised from $7.25 to $15 like overnight. So you get into conversations of, you know, inflation and unemployment rates and, you know, the sort of uh, antidote, like nobody's going to pay a $16 or uh, no one's going to pay a, a 16 year old high school kid, you know, $15 an hour to flip burgers at McDonald's and, you know, the automation that goes on at, at Wawa. So we're going to lose cashier jobs because everything's going to be automated. You know, it's all going to be controlled by robots, right? Um, 
so like let's sort of think through this thing and even at the end of it if i'm like okay i still think we all agree on 15 dollars minimum wage is good at least we got there in a way where our ideas were challenged and we were forced to defend them as opposed to all you know all of us just being very catty and saying we're right they're wrong we're righteous and they're evil people instead we're like look we think we're right they probably have good reasons too let's think about what their good reasons are let's try to like steel man this argument what's the best argument they have i'm gonna play devil's advocate um and and there you have it all right i think this is on the exam so i'm just gonna really quickly mention uh devil's advocate is a term that comes out of the catholic church uh so make sure you know if you want some more information you can google it but what the devil's advocate is is that anytime a person who has died and is and they are thinking about um canonizing that person into sainthood in the in the catholic church what the catholic church does is they put together this board right of people who have to sort of uh do some research and vote on whether or not this person is canonized and then they become a saint and part of it is like these people are supposed to go out in the world and sort of find miracles that these people performed while they were on earth etc or you know maybe they're dead now but it's like you know i prayed to uh, Mother Teresa, right? And then like, you know, things were healed in my life. Um, and then the board has to confirm that. And is this a real miracle? Is it a fake miracle? Whatever, right? So there's a board of individuals who go out and they try to canonize people. The Catholic Church, to their credit, right? This is a great thing that the Catholic Church does, at least as far as like some sort of reflection. Is on that board, they hire someone who they, who, who they call the devil's advocate. And that person on that board, their sole responsibility is to try to debunk everything. Their, their job is like, what are the ways in which this person should not be a saint, right? So for instance, when Mother Teresa, you probably heard her name at least, when they were thinking about canonizing her uh, in the early 2000s, um, the Catholic Church hired uh, this guy named Christopher Hitchens to be the devil's advocate. Now, Christopher Hitchens is a huge critic of Mother Teresa. He is a very um, colorful uh, atheist, uh, very out, what was he passed away a couple years ago very outspoken um atheist like does not hold back right his atheism um but the catholic church was like hey you get to be devil's advocate you get to tell us all the ways in which mother Teresa should not be so you get to debunk all of the evidence that we bring forward we want you to offer the counter evidence all right um different companies and organizations have what they call obudsmans and these are individuals who are hired within the company to keep the company in check. So the company actually pays these individuals um, a salary, like a good salary, uh, to be critical of the company, right? Um, I think ESPN has an individual like this um, who will just constantly, like the, the only articles they write is to be critical and to critique, you know, the way in which ESPN does business. So if you have, if, if you act, and like, like don't take it personally, right? But instead say like, look, if I'm around a lot of people who have similar interests as I do, right? So religion is a similar interest, you know, it's something that, you know, Christopher Hitchens was interested in, right? Um, the people who work at ESPN are obviously interested in the company and, and, and sports culture and everything else. But if you're like, you should be willing to say, look, I'm actively gonna seek out people who disagree with me because I wanna make sure that my ideas are right, as opposed to me just getting emotionally attached to an idea. Um, if you look at Abraham Lincoln, for instance, um, there's this great book called Team of Rivals um, by Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, the movie Lincoln was roughly based off a section of this book. Um, and she, the, the Team of Rivals is the, the, the title of the book, and it comes from this idea that once Lincoln was elected president, everyone who was campaigning against him, he brought all of them into his cabinet. And the reason was is because he wanted this team, his, his secretary of war, secretary of um, you know, every, you know, all, all these individuals, right? Um, all of his secretaries of his cabinet, he wanted them to be formidable. He wanted them to be people who were critical of him. So he said, I'm the president now, and all the people who are gonna be in my cabinet, I want them to be former rivals because I know that they're gonna challenge me on my policy decisions. Um, I know they're gonna, I, he, like the civil war was kind of brewing. He wanted people who were gonna be, who, who were gonna rival with him, right? Um, so that's who Lincoln kept around him, right? And this is like a sort of a good sign of a good president. Uh, if you sort of look through history is who the president surround um, himself with. Did the former president, whoever it is you're researching, 
Did they just find people who always agreed with them? Um, or did they actively seek out people who's like, look, like you and I disagree strongly, but I'm going to make you my secretary of whatever, because I think you have good ideas. Like at the end of the day, like I'm the president, I can make the final decision, but I know that you are going to challenge those decisions and, you know, really force me to do my research with regard to these decisions. So, you know, a good leader is someone who actively seeks out people to be the devil's advocate against it. That's, you know, somebody who is reflexive enough to say, you know, I want my ideas to be stronger, so I'm going to encourage people to challenge my ideas. Okay, with regard to Harrison Bergeron, this is the last part. Think about the ways in which groupthink happens in that short story, right? Um, so you're going you're gonna to connect Harrison Bergeron to these ideas of um, small group to groupthink uh, to the ways in which these cultures sort of become homogenized and everybody just sort of becomes the same, right? Um, in different classes, I've talked a little bit about the difference between the word equality and the word sameness, right? So we can say like we want equality, which is equality under the law. We want everyone to have equal opportunities to go and sort of pursue their life dreams. But that doesn't mean that we're all the same, right? Um, that doesn't mean that everybody has to be a clone of everybody else. Everybody's going to have different paths, different jobs, and that's going to lead to different outcomes for their lives, right? Um, so... Harrison Bergeron kind of uh, tries to sort of wrestle with this issue, the short story, right? Equality versus sameness. Um, okay, uh, read that, turn in your uh, paper, and then um, make sure you watch the other video on, on uh, small group communication today.